This video provides the solutions and discussion for exercise five, which is about batch computing and in particular running a script on Lotus. It's assumed that you've already watched the first video describing the task and this video talks through the details of how to do it. So just a quick reminder on the scenario and the objectives. So having established in exercise four that I can extract the TCC variable from a single era interim data file in the CEDA archive, I now wish to extract that data for an entire month. I'm going to write some simple scripts that will batch up separate processes to run the CDO command to extract TCC from each of the files. There are four six hourly files for each day and so my main script will extract data for each one of those and then a separate script will, will run that 30 times once for each day in September 2018 and each run will be submitted to the Lotus cluster. After completing this exercise I will be able to write scripts to batch up tasks and submit those scripts to the Lotus cluster. So here's how you might go about completing the task. So I'll drop down here to the cheats, cheat sheet section of the exercise and we can work our way through it. So over here on the right hand side I have a terminal window and my starting point is that I'm logged into a Jasmine login server. If you need to look up how to do that it's all described in exercise one. So the next thing I want to do is I want to SSH through to a scientific analysis server and I've chosen Sci5 here. And you can see that when you've logged into a login server it lists the usage of the various um, scientific analysis servers, how many people are on them, the free memory, etc. So in I go. And the next task is that I need to write a wrapper script called extract era data sh that calls the CDO extraction command that we looked at in exercise four. So the specification for this script is that it needs to take a command line argument that sets the date in the form of year, month, and day. It needs to locate four six hourly input files for the date provided. It then needs to activate the software environment that contains the CDO tool. And then for each six hourly file, it needs to define the output file path and run the CDO tool to extract the TCC variable in the same way that we did in exercise four. So if you are stuck, you can use a script that's located here at this location um, during the workshop, but also the source code is available here on GitHub at this link. So I can open that up and we can have a little view of what's in there. But I'm also going to bring it up here because there is a version that I've got accessible here on Jasmine. So it's in the code directory and the script is called extract era data. So I will take a moment to talk you through the details of this script. So the first section here, this takes the single command line argument, which is the day, and it breaks it up into year, month and day components, which are used down here to specify the file paths because we need to have directories for year, month, and day. We then set the output directory where we're going to be writing the outputs. And here I'm using the workshop group workspace. And I'm using my own username here in the path. So it will be unique to me as a user. I make that output directory and any parent directories that are required. And then I'm specifying the variable ID that I want to read in from the files and I'm specifying a pattern here that I want to look for um, data files in. So anything that matches the particular year, month and day of interest, and then any files that begin GGAS um, 
and end in .nc for netcdf will match. I need to activate an environment that contains the CDO tools and I know that the, mod, the, the Jaspi environment is available for that so I call module load Jaspi and that will set my paths and be able to find the CDO tool. And now I create a loop in which I will loop through all the files that matched this list here. I will just um, echo that I'm subsetting that each file to the screen. Um, I'm setting an, an output name here. So I'm, I'm using the variable ID and information from the input file to set an output file name, deciding to put that in the output directory. And then I'm calling the CDO command in exactly the same way that we did in exercise four. So I'm saying I want to extract the variable ID TCC from the input file and write it to the output file. And this will run for the four six hourly files in that day. So that's the extract era data script. And then I also need another script, which is my submit all script. And this is going to loop over the dates from the 1st to the 2nd of September 2018. And it will call the extract era data script. And it will submit those jobs to Lotus. So let's just have a look at that script and see what it's doing. So the first thing it does here is it sets a few variables. So it says the extractor script is this one we've already written. It says where it's going to write the, the Lotus outputs. So these are not the output files. These are used further down and I will explain them. It makes the output directory if it doesn't already exist and it sets the queue to be used. So here I'm using the short serial queue. If you're working on the Jasmine workshop, you may well want to change this to the workshop queue that's specifically set up for short term use during the Jasmine workshop. So we said that we wanted to loop through from the 1st to the 2nd of September to call our script. And that's what this loop is doing here. And we actually set the day that we are going to run um, for each call to Lotus. So each time we submit a job, we're going to set that here. So this takes 2018-01 and, and then it adds on a two digit day to the end of that. We um, echo a string to the terminal to say what we are running. And then finally, we submit the job to Lotus. So the key thing here is that we are calling the sbatch command to submit jobs to Lotus. We are giving it the, the queue name. It's minus P for partition. Partitions and queues are essentially the same thing. We are saying that this will run for a maximum of five minutes because it's a, a very quick job. Um, and then we give it a minus O and a minus E option. And these stand for the, the output file that goes to standard output and the standard error file. So over here on the left hand side, just draw attention to those. Um, these should be unique to each job that you're running on Lotus. And if you put the percent %j um, string into the file name or the directory name, then these will all be unique. And as you can see over here on the script, we've got the, the day and then percent %j, which is the, the job identifier on Slurm, and then the output for standard output. And then for, for standard error, we're using minus E and then the same convention, but with E double R. And the end here is the same thing that we would run locally. So extractor is the name of the script and day will be the day. So all of that is in a loop and that should run twice. So I've said over here, the queue name is short serial, but you could change it to workshop if you're working on the workshop. The job duration is five minutes. Um, so in this case, we've just put five. We could equally um, specify it in this way. And you can even give hints in terms of the estimate, estimated duration. Now, there's a help page about submitting jobs to Lotus. And so you can find out more information if you want to from there. So what we'll do first is we'll just double check that we can run our job locally. So if I look for the 
extract era data script here i'm just going to say can i run it for 2010-0101 okay and as you can see it's stepping through the four time steps so the first one was for midnight then 6 a.m midday and then 6 p.m and it's process each of those data sets and if we just have another quick look at the um, extract script we can see where it was going to write the outputs so we'll just have a look in there and we can see that's written four outputs so in this case it was 2010-0101 but when we're running it um, through Lotus we want to run it for 2018 through the submit script okay so that's all looking good so I'm now going to run the submit all script and this is going to submit a job for 2018-0101 and 2018-0102 so if I type SQ we can now see that there are some jobs running so these are in the short serial queue, queue. it gives the name of the script it tells, says my name is the user and the status here is R and that means it's running and over here on the right hand side it's telling us that it's running on one node and it's telling that the, the host name it happens to be running on that doesn't really matter to you but sometimes when you're tracking what's going on with if there is any debugging required it's sometimes useful to know which host you're running on on the left hand side you have the job IDs so I'm running SQ again and as you can see now these have all completed so what we want to do next is just have a quick check to see whether the jobs have actually worked so if we look in the outputs again we can now see that as well as having the 2010 files I've now got the 2018 01 files and the 2018 02 files so it looks like it's running properly I'm also going to quickly have a look at my Lotus outputs directory to just show you what what you can find in there so we specified that we wanted to write the standard error from each Lotus job to these .err files and the standard output to dot out files so and we can actually interrogate any of these files just to double check so we're happy that all of those things are good so we can now modify our script and say we want to run it for the whole month so the sequence instead of being first to the second we change it from the first to the 30th and I just type submit all again and you can see this time it's told us it's submitting 30 jobs to Lotus I type SQ and already you can see some of these jobs are pending so this these first jobs on the list they say they're pending and the rest of them are actually running now if I type SQ again some of them are now completing and some of them are running so one of the things that you can also do is you can cancel a job so I'm going to pick a certain job here you just give it the job ID run S cancel and then that will tell the scheduler to cancel that job so it's, it's very useful to know that because there are times when you may have submitted a number of jobs they may all be sitting in the queue and then you realize there's something incorrect about them that you need to fix so you can just get the list of job IDs and call s cancel to do that you can see here that most of them have now run and there are just a, a, a handful that are still completing now and if we go all the way back to look at our outputs can now see that we've got the full list of outputs all the way from the 1st of September all the way to the 30th okay so now we've completed the task let's have a look at some of the alternative approaches and best practice guidance so this exercise has demonstrated how we can create a script that takes an argument to process a single component of an overall task we've created a wrapper script that loops through all of the components that need to be processed 
and we've seen how we can submit each of those components as a Lotus job using the sbatch command. We've seen how we can define various command line arguments for sbatch um, to, to set and configure it to run in certain ways. And we've looked at other Slurm commands such as sq and scancel. So in terms of alternative approaches, um, one thing you might like to do is write your output to a scratch directory. There are two main scenarios in which you might like to do this. The first is when you only need to store an output file for temporary use, such as intermediate files in your workflow. And in other cases, you might find it's more performant to write some data to scratch before moving the data you want to keep to a group workspace. There's a help page which tells you all about the different dismounts on Jasmine and that describes two types of scratch space. So there is scratch PW which supports parallel write and scratch NOPW which does not support parallel write. In our example here running the CDO command all of our um, tasks were completely independent and therefore we can use the, the non-parallel write option and if you needed to do that you can create your own user directory under slash work slash scratch NOPW, um, make that directory and then in your code instead of setting your output file path and your output directory to a group workspace you can specify you want to write to scratch and it will write your outputs there. One th important thing to say is that when you're finished it's very important that you tidy up so please do not leave any data in the scratch areas um, make sure you've removed them um, the reason for this is that first of all scratch is highly contested in that there are many hundreds of jasmine users potentially all needing to access it at the same time and there is limited data space but also um, we have cleanup processes in place. You cannot rely on data persisting on Scratch. So it's always best to either remove it or, or move it to a group workspace if you need to keep it. Another approach you might take is that you might be interested in um, specifying the memory requirements of your job. So if your job has a significant memory footprint, the best thing to do is to run a single iteration on Lotus and review the standard output file to examine the memory usage and then once you've done that in subsequent subsequent um, calls to sbatch when you're right sending more jobs to lotus you can actually reserve an appropriate memory allocation to suit your job this particular task demonstrates best practice um, in in two ways so firstly it's all about building up in stages before running your full workflow on Lotus. So typically you need to develop some code and you need to check your code, find out if it's really doing the thing you expect it to be doing. So you look at the outputs, you look at the logs, you look at any error logs, etc. So typically you will you will run on the Sci servers um, and you can run locally for one or two iterations of a bigger workflow. When you're happy everything's working properly then it's sensible to again run two or two one or two iterations on lotus check that everything ran correctly on lotus so again take the time to look at the standard error and the standard output files and the outputs that you expect to be generated from your main processing and then finally when you're happy that it's all working perfectly that's the time when you submit a full batch of all your jobs to lotus um, and just to reiterate, as we did in exercise four, at the end, it's always very important to check you've not left any files accidentally on the system. So particularly in, in directories such as such as slash temp, which can fill up, just make sure that, that no aspect of your processing is, is leaving temporary files around that may fill things up and cause problems for others. So let's just have a quick look at some of the questions that were posed in the exercise so one of the questions is that you learnt about some basic commands to in interact with slurm such as sbatch and sq which other commands might be useful when interacting with the scheduler so we have a help page which slow shows other slurm commands 
such as S cancel and S control. We'll just have a quick look at the help page here. Down here in table three, S cancel, S control. And these show you different things that you might need to do um, to interact with your jobs. You can also look up the full Slurm reference guide online. So which queues are available on Lotus and what's the difference between them and why would you choose one over another? We have a help page that specifically tells you about the Slurm queues. And you can see a list of them here and then you can find out a whole lot more about and why you might want to use them. And finally, how can you instruct Slurm to allocate CPUs and memory to specific jobs when you run them? So table two of our quick reference LSF to Slurm web page includes a list of all the Slurm commands and some of them we've seen already, but you can see here there are instructions for allocating memory and there are instructions for allocating the number of cores to a specific command. So that brings us to the end of this video. If you need any further information, here are some links to our website and the Jasmine help documentation. Please have a look at it. And if you cannot find what you're looking for, then feel free to contact us at the support email here.